I'm Aaron David Miller, and this is Carnegie Connects. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. I truly hope you're safe, sound, and of course, healthy. I'm Aaron David Miller, a senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment, and welcome to Carnegie Connects, a set of virtual conversations, at least for now, on issues of critical importance to America and to the world. I'm truly pleased today to host a former colleague at the Department of State, Francis uh, Fukuyama, who is now actually going to be and is now a, a uh, non-resident scholar at, uh, at the Carnegie Endowment. So um, a former colleague and now uh, one in real time. Um, and I remember with some fondness, Frank, the uh, welcome to Carnegie Connects, the heady days uh, at policy planning in the late 80s, particularly under former Secretary of State uh, uh, James Baker. I also had either had forgotten or didn't realize that we also shared a, another common interest. You, I think, must have been the early 80s, were on the U.S. delegation to um, the autonomy talks between the, right. uh, between the Israelis right. and the Egyptians. So again, welcome. Um, Thanks very much. It's unlike great to you, unlike you, after the autonomy talks experience, I decided that I wasn't going to have anything to do with the uh, Israeli-Palestinian issue because it was just too difficult. So I admire you for sticking with it all these years. And, you know, Frank, in hindsight, um, it was probably a wise decision on your part. The world's grown a lot larger despite the importance of that problem. And we're going to find out today. So I can think of no one better to discuss the state and fate of America and the world, a uh, fairly global, if not galactic topic, uh, than you. And I want to divide our 40 plus minutes into two halves, beginning with um, the kinds of seemingly impossible problems that appear to confront the United States, a, a cruel and unforgiving world in so many respects. And you know, government, in government, they talk priorities. Um, I'm reminded of, of a quote from FDR who reportedly said of Lincoln, this is uh, one of our greatest presidents talking about our undeniably greatest president. He, Roosevelt said that he thought Lincoln died a sad man because he couldn't have everything. And governing in the end really is about setting priorities and choosing. So I've chosen three. You're familiar with all of them. So uh, let's begin. Um, I want to first start on uh, climate um, and get your take on um, COP26 and uh, the events and final declaration of Glasgow. I suppose, and I'm not a cynic about this, I realize the importance, but if in fact after 26 meetings they finally acknowledge fossil fuels in the actual declaration, hmm. uh, Houston, don't we have a problem on this issue? Well, I have uh, for long thought that these uh, global gab fests like COP26 are really not where the main action is. So there's no question that we're facing a global, you know, uh, really impossible challenge in terms of uh, carbon emissions. But I think that the kinds of verbal declarations that are made at these summits are, you know, really not worth the paper they're printed on because the real issue is whether countries can actually implement uh, uh, the promises that they make. And that's really where I think the big governance challenges are because you know, there, there's this attitude that surrounds these summits that it's basically a moral problem and that somehow you have these Neanderthals that don't understand that climate is a big issue and you simply have to convince them that climate justice requires, you know, adjusting their uh, their preferences. And I think that elides the fact that you've got really powerful uh, interests at stake. So you look at what's going on in Europe right now, you know, there isn't a greener part of the world than the European Union, especially Germany. Uh, and they've made the, you know, the greatest policy commitments in terms of shifting to alternatives, but they're still using coal. And in fact, because of the gas crisis that's going on and the, you know, the rapid increase in natural gas prices, uh, they're facing a real crisis this summer because there simply isn't an alternative to um, using fossil fuels. And, and there's just no way that they're going to continue to, you know, shutter uh, 
coal plants in Germany uh, because of these very powerful interests. And so I think unless you begin to address you know, some of the real big economic incentives that lie in the way of actually meeting those commitments, doesn't matter what you promise at an international summit, uh, it isn't going to happen. I think furthermore, just one, one sure. <laughs> just to add to this, the real problem is really not in uh, Europe or North America. Uh, if you look at the projections for who's going to be emitting carbon over the next uh, 30 years, it's really the developing world that amounts to, you know, something like 80, 85 percent of all the new carbon that's going to be uh, uh, emitted. And so if you don't really change the behavior of uh, uh, China primarily and India, it's going to be very hard to make any, you know, headway just doing stuff in, in Europe or the United States. Uh, and so that's something where I think the real focus needs to be. You know, it, it's intriguing that you describe this sort of a, as a cognitive problem, that people need to be per persuaded uh, as if driven by some moral or ethical preoccupation, they're going to fundamentally alter nation state behavior. You, you've written a lot about what you call climate realism. And I think it's tethered to the notion that there is no supranational organization that's going to emerge that somehow is going to get the acquiescence of the major emitters um, to deal with the national sovereignty issue. So I, I guess that's the question. Isn't it in the end, saving the planet, you know, and it's a planetary human issue, but saving the planet ultimately depends on a series of very imperfect and flawed nation states who have their own interests and, as we'll see with COVID, basically tenaciously guard their so sovereignty, whether it's their economies or or vaccine nationalism. So how do you even begin to, to keep the 1.5 alive slogan alive when, in fact, these national interests conflict with the broader interests of the, of the planetary common? Well, uh, I, I think the first thing I have to say is I don't really see an alternative to acting through uh, existing nation states. You know, there's a lot of talk about this planetary consciousness that needs to happen in order to deal with something like uh, global warming and suggestions that existing nations need to delegate serious amounts of power up to some kind of a supranational institution. And I just think that this is both uh, normatively and practically a non-starter. The normative problem really has to do with power because if you're talking about going beyond the nation state and seriously delegating coercive power to some kind of international body, uh, you know, we've had two, 300 years of experience in creating nation states that concentrate power, but also limit it through law, through democracy, through various kinds of institutions of constraint. We have no experience doing that at a global international level. So if you create a international executive with real coercive power, meaning you know, police, uh, the ability to arrest people and, and really to force nations to follow certain international rules, are you also going to have an international legislature? Are you going to have an international court system that will tell that executive when they violated uh, basic human rights norms? So that's the first thing. The second thing is just a practical one. I cannot possibly imagine either China or the United States, uh, the two largest emitters, ever actually agreeing to uh, cede significant power to a body like this. It just isn't going right. to happen. And I just think that means that we're stuck with the existing nations and they're going to have to see that it is in their self-interest to make you know, short-term economic sacrifices in order to control uh, carbon emissions. We're getting there. You know, it's now the case that something like 70% of Republicans actually now believe that this is a real problem, which is a big improvement over the situation just a few years ago when a majority thought that this was just a big hoax uh, that was meant to cripple the United States. So there is progress being uh, made, but I, I'm afraid that it is going to have to come at the level of, of individual nations. But changing those calculations, like, for example, in any negotiation, if you don't have uh, commensurate amounts of pain on one hand, or alternatively, not alternatively, and um, significant amounts of gain, if there's no pain, no gain, 
then you essentially have status quo on issues that cut to the core of a nation's identity, their politics, and, and their national sovereignty. So you've got fires in Siberia, you've got floods in China, you've got floods in Germany, you've got all kinds of nat natural disasters here. Aren't the, isn't reality the greatest shaper and inspirer yeah, yeah. of getting people to do things? And yet, no, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. And I think we're seeing, you know, we're seeing the climate change right in front of us. I live in California. Every single year, the you know the level of, of fires in this state has increased. Uh, every August now in Palo Alto, we can't see the horizon because of all the smoke, you know, coming from fires. And I think that. The likelihood is in 20 years, you know, a lot of California could look like Arizona or Nevada uh, as a result of, you know, stuff that's very visible to uh, really to everybody. So I think that it is this sense of immediate crisis that is going to have to drive the politics and, you know, really shift some of those calculations. And, you know, it's actually kind of impressive the way that, uh, you know, in a certain sense, uh, you know, investors are now really not willing to put the, the kind of money they did behind fossil fuels, you know, because they kind of see the handwriting uh, on the wall, but a lot more has to happen. But I think that's the way it's going to happen and not, you know, by delegating power to some, uh, you know, unaccountable uh, international body. Time, unfortunately, which is the ultimate sort of arbiter of what succeeds and fails in life is not an, is not an ally, unfortunately. I mean, you could make the argument that, um, you know, 20 years from now will be 20 years too late. Uh, yeah, I really wonder if that's true, because it does seem to me that we're going to not just mitigate uh, carbon emissions, we're also going to adapt to it, and we're adapting already. Uh, some some of it may not make sense, like building higher levees and seawalls, you know, to protect right. Houston and New Orleans. Uh, but a lot of it is sensible. I mean, there's no reason why the federal government should subsidize insurance for barrier islands and people living in wild, uh, in, in forested areas that are subject to, you know, uh, to natural disasters. And I think, uh, you know, there's a lot of investment that's going to need to take place in order to, you know, be resilient. Uh, and that's really where I think the action is going to have to be concentrated. And we're already beginning to do that. So, you know, I, I, I think that it's not an either or thing that we're in this total uh, collapse of civilization or things are more or less normal. I think there will be this gradual you know, process of adapt adaptation. I'm glad you made that point because if it was uh, breakdown or breakthrough, uh, that's usually not the way the world works. It's no. usually something in between. I'm just hoping the in between, we won't run out of time by following the in between. Okay, so let's turn to another seemingly difficult, not intractable, but difficult issue, and that's COVID. You might make the case, arguably, that COVID was the most, I don't know if you agree or not, the, the single most world-altering event, take climate out of it, since the end of the Second World War. I mean, it was truly an extraordinary experience, if you could think about it in the abstract. Um, and we're now, maybe, maybe, in a sort of transition from COVID as an existential threat, even though the variants are out there, much of the world, half of the world or more is not only uh, not fully vaccinated, but underrepresented in terms of vaccinations. But we're shifting from COVID as an existential problem to a kind of a manageable one. And yet, if the scientists are right, two thirds of the newly discovered pathogens in the world are, are viruses. And I think in, in many respects, maybe it'll be 100 years from now, like the great influenza, maybe sooner, we're going to be faced with another, another pandemic. So you've written that COVID, um, I don't want to move forward on this, we got enough problems. You've written mm -hmm. that COVID was a global stress test. So, and I think that's a, it's, it's a, an intriguing way to put it. So how did the world do, in your view, um, I think I know the answer to this, pass or fail. And those <laughs> nations that did better, what what distinguished them? You know, I would say, uh, well, first of all, I wrote a piece in Foreign Affairs uh, in the summer of 2020 when the 
the epidemic was just getting going. And I would say that virtually everything I wrote in that has been disproven by events or overtaken by events because the disease has uh, mutated in you know, very unexpected ways. And so many countries that looked like they were doing great, like Australia and New Zealand, a year later didn't look like they were, you know, they were doing nearly as well. Or many of these countries in Asia, like Vietnam, that had very low levels, all of a sudden have been overtaken by it. So it's very, you, you want to hesitate a little bit before drawing uh, too many global uh, conclusions. The one thing I would say is pretty clear from the experience of the United States and a handful of other countries is that social trust is really, really important. Uh, and that works in two directions. It works horizontally. So people have to be able to trust the government that they basically know what they're doing and that if they issue a public health mandate, it actually is for the sake of a, a, a public good. And the second is a kind of horizontal trust among citizens that, you know, they they understand that their behavior affects other people in a public health emergency. And so something like getting vaccinated is not just a matter of personal choice, uh, right. but it actually, you know, affects the, the people around you. And in that respect, unfortunately, the United States, you know, has been a big failure because uh, in both respects, you know, the absence of trust has been uh, very, very striking. Whereas in, especially in Northern Europe, you know, you have a number of countries, or I would say this is true in Northeast Asia as well, Japan, Korea, uh, countries of that sort, there's never been this toxic anti-statism, you know, this high degree of distrust of the government just for being the government. And, you know, a greater sense that actually the government does represent a kind of public good and that we have to support, you know, the, the kinds of measures that are recommended. And I would say that if you do have that kind of both horizontal and vertical trust, all other things being equal, you're probably going to do a lot better uh, than in a country that's sharply divided. And this is the crazy thing about, you know, the way we've handled COVID in the United States, something is straightforward as getting vaccinated has now suddenly become, you know, a political marker of, uh, you know, of uh, this larger polarization that we've been facing. Well, yeah, we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, I mean, I, I did read that March 2020 foreign affairs article. Actually, I'm not sure you do yourself justice because some of the headlines and trend lines you identify, uh, and you're very careful in painting two alternative futures, depending on how nations, individuals behaved in the face of this virus. But it, uh, trust isn't enough. Um, I think you and others have identified at least two additional issues yeah. that are critically important. One is something you would have thought we have an abundance in this country, although the federal system probably worked against it, which is state, which is state capacity. Mm -hmm. The how-to of government. But right. that's also tethered to another issue. And if you don't have uh, the L word, leadership, mm -hmm. then no matter how much state capacity you have, um, you're not going to be able to project your power internally and address the problem. So you have state capacity, you have trust, and horizontal uh, vertical thing is really interesting. And you've got um, leadership. So yeah, let's, give, let's give the let's give the U.S. a grade, but I also want to come back to whether democracies, a, an issue you know well, and or authoritarian polities fared better in coping with this virus. But these three elements give give the give America a grade. You've already given a grade on on the trust issue, but on state capacity and leadership. Well, the state capacity issue is a complicated one. Uh, if you read um, Michael Lewis's most recent book, The Premonition, he's actually very critical of the CDC, but not for the reasons that a lot of conservatives have been. I mean, he actually argues that they became too risk averse as a result of something, you know, the swine flu uh, uh, scare back in the late 1970s and that they didn't move quickly enough uh, and that this is a general problem with American bureaucracy, that we've trained bureaucrats to be risk averse in ways that are detrimental ultimately to really dealing with something like the pandemic. But uh, I, you know, the federalism part, 
it, it cuts both ways. Uh, it does. Because, uh, there were states that were extremely quick. Uh, California, you know, uh, actually California grants uh, the local county health officers uh, authority that even the governor doesn't have in ordering lockdowns and uh, mask wearing and this sort of thing. And so, you know, the, it was quite functional. In other places, primarily in red states, uh, you either didn't have the capacity because like Mississippi or Arkansas, the, they just don't have the resources uh, or uh, the, the leadership question comes into play where uh, you can have the best capacity in the world, but if you're not going to use it, uh, or indeed if you are going to recommend policies that deliberately go against, you know, the recommendations of the public health authorities, then obviously you're not going to uh, do well. So I would say the, you know, the grade in terms of capacity is maybe, I don't know, a B or something like that. If you average across all of the American, uh, all of the American states, the leadership, uh, you know, again, it, it, it's been so politically divided that some states, you know, got terrible grades and, and others, you know, did, uh, uh, did reasonably well. But again, states that looked like they were doing well at certain periods, you know, like, um, well, or, or that looked like they were doing badly, like New York State, you know, in the early days was a total disaster. Since then, you know, has looked a lot better. Uh, but there are many anomalies like Florida, you know, Florida in a way should have done a lot worse than it did earlier than it did because of, you know, the decisions taken by uh, Ron DeSantis, uh, and yet they don't seem to have been, you know, the, the correlation there between bad leadership and outcomes is not, you know, it's not as strong as one would have imagined. I mean, this isn't a rhetorical question, but I mean, we talked about the federal structure, but, you know, I, I, I'm fascinated by the presidency. I read a book on greatness in the presidency. And, I, you know, I, I wonder as a thought experiment, had you had a president tethered to science um, rather than to his own vanity, sensibilities, uh, his reelection prospects, um, willing to um, create a uh, whole command structure to deal with the COVID. It would have made a big difference. I mean, I, I I can't imagine it wouldn't. I guess the question is, given the nature of American society, and the 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 sort of independent, don't tread on me strains that have existed in this country since the Republic, um, how much of a difference could it have made? Jack Kennedy used to love this line out of Shakespeare. One character says to the other, "I can command." Um, the spirits from the vasty, vasty deep. And the other replies, um, but do they come when you call? Right. And right. I guess that's the real question in 2021 America. Had you had national leadership, real national leadership, would they have come when, when the president called? Uh, I think so. Uh, I think that if uh, the President Trump and other Republican governors taking cues from him had done the responsible thing and said, yes, you know, everybody should be cautious, they should social distance, they should wear masks. Uh, yeah, I think that would have made a, a, a big difference. Uh, and it would have squelched the stuff that appeared at the peripheries, you know, the whole anti-vax movement had been a very peripheral, peripheral social phenomenon prior to the pandemic. But because there was no leadership at the top of one of the big American parties, it was allowed to metastasize and meld with all of the other resentments, all of the other cultural resentments that existed uh, in the country. Uh, to the point where it actually escaped the control of the people at the top. So th it was interesting. A couple of months ago, Trump had a <clears throat> had one of his big rallies, and he actually recommended getting vaccinated. And the people at the rally started to boo him. Uh, so it's as if he kind of triggered this. He created this monster that even at this point he's not able to control because. You know, it's so much fed this uh, narrative on the right of 
elite conspiracy and things not being you know what they seem uh and that you know is a broader phenomenon that was very much encouraged by uh individual leaders and it didn't have to be that way i, I don't think it had to be that way no i would agree um before we turn to the fate and state of the republic um Let's deal briefly, and I wish we had more time, to a subject that I know you've written a lot on, which is democracies, those rising, those ret retreating. It's a good segue to the U.S. Uh, Ann Applebaum has a piece in The Atlantic this week called uh, The Bad Guys Are Winning. Freedom House has reported now for the 15th consecutive year that democracies are in retreat. In 2019, the, two, the world's two largest democracies, India and the United States, Freedom House reports the most precipitous declines in those two. And India now shares a distinction, according to Freedom House, of not being free, but now is tethered to their des designation of partly free. So I guess the question is, we'd be in denial if we suggested democracies around the world aren't in retreat. I guess the question is, and this gets to the whole end of history argument to some degree, is there an end state or are we just talking about a sort of cycling through of various phases where certain things are tried, some succeed, some fail, there are default positions in certain forms of government, the nation state remains the most viable uh, concept, I think. Um, but how do you see the whole democracy and recession and retreat phenomenon? What's causing well, it? Yeah, it, it's, it's certainly a reality. And even since that Freedom House, Freedom in the World 2020 report, uh, you've had a coup in Myanmar, you've had a presidential takeover in Tunisia, right. and now you've had a coup in Sudan. And so three of the countries that looked like they were moving towards, and Ethiopia is now falling into a you know a really terrible civil war. So even the countries that look like bright spots over the last uh, decade have you know, now uh, turned sour. So there's no question that we're in a very severe uh, democratic recession. Uh, and it is driven, I think, also by geopolitics because uh, unlike the situation 10 or 15 years ago, Russia and China are both consolidated and they've now shifted over into promoting and projecting their authoritarian model uh, outwards into, into the rest of the world. And the United States, you know, is no longer uh, a beacon of democracy. It simply isn't. I can see this in, for example, my Chinese students who I think, well, actually a lot of them have disappeared after COVID, but, uh, you know, I would say that 15 years ago, uniformly, they would have said, we want China to be a democracy like the United States. And today they don't say that anymore. You know, they're kind of contemptuous of American democracy. They think that China has a model that is working, uh, you know, a lot better than that of the United States. And I think a lot of people around the world have taken their cues from the apparent you know, travails of the world's largest democracy to say that the system as a whole doesn't work. Uh, what's going to happen in the future? I wish I knew, uh, but I don't think that we're in a position to throw in the towel because, you know, democracy, the argument about democracy, and certainly the one I made in the end of history, was not that there's this inevitable machine that's pushing forward regardless of human agency and the decisions that individual voters and leaders take uh you know democracy has to be defended and it has to be promoted and that's an ongoing struggle and i don't think that that battle has been lost uh you know just in the past few months you've actually had a reversal of several you know kind of populist gains in uh, uh various places, you know, in Istanbul and in Budapest and in Slovakia and, you know, the Czech Republic. I mean, there have been a lot of places where actually populist leaders have been pushed out of power. Uh, and there's a learning process going on there because I think that only happens when the liberal parties, the anti-populist, anti-authoritarian parties uh, unite. And if they don't unite, uh, you know, the, the authoritarians really have 
uh, a clear field to operate on. Uh, so it really does depend, I think, on decisions that are being taken. By the way, I think there's a, I, I, I know you want to segue to the U.S., but it applies in the United States uh, itself. You know, the Democrats have been fighting among themselves, uh, right. despite the fact that they won both houses of Congress and the presidency. They've been spending more time fighting each other uh, than worrying about the state of American democracy. And so I think that that lesson is one that carries over to very many countries, that democracy can be strong and it can fight back very effectively, but only if people that are truly committed to democracy actually figure out how to build coalitions and to work with one another and to get on the same page in opposing you know, these either populist or anti-democratic forces. Right, and there, therein I think lies uh, a, a certain dynamic that I want to ask you about. There's a there's a recent study. Uh, I think the New York Times reported it yesterday by a nonprofit in Sweden, Videm, showing that retreat across the board by democracies is not driven by a bunch of predatory powers trying to undermine their system from within, but by the rot from within. We have seen the enemy, and the enemy is us. And it's a good segue into, into America. I mean, if Joe Biden were on this call uh, <laughs> with us, I think he might, he wouldn't say it, but I think he would think it, that the greatest threat to this republic does not lie in a, in a single foreign policy challenge or combination of challenges. It lies in the three or four, he wouldn't call them crises because it's, po it's politically fraught, but I'll call them crises that confront the Republic. Governance, the notion of what Rand called truth decay. How can you have effective self-governance when millions of Americans disagree with other millions of Americans about basic facts and reality? That opens the door to a new definition of the truth which somebody, a he or she, could ride in on a horse and basically proclaim what the truth is. If we can't ourselves decide what it is, January 6th is an example of that. So um, if you had to define, and we live in a glass house now, your Chinese students are absolutely right. We live in a glass house. Um, what are the, in your view, what are the major takeaways of the of the challenges that are affecting America's broken house right now? How would you kind of synthesize them if you could? Uh, well, I start in many of the same places that uh, you began with. Obviously the internet has completely undermined the gatekeepers that were responsible for vetting, you know, basic factual information uh, and had made possible you know, these wild conspiracy theories about how the world is actually behaving according to a different plan that's been organized by you know malevolent elites uh, and so forth and i really think that that would not be possible uh were it not for that new information universe but you know i do think that there has been a kind of organized uh, attack on liberal uh institutions more an attack on liberalism than on democracy. That is to say on the notion that we should have limited government that protects the right of individuals based on a rule of law uh, uh, and a constitutional order. Uh, and that has been uh, really criticized by both the, uh, the right and the left. Uh, I've actually written a book, uh, which is a defense of classical liberalism Mm -hmm. uh, that's going to be published next uh, spring, uh, where I try to lay out the, you know, the history of this. And I think that the attacks on liberal values and institutions have existed on both sides, and they feed off of each other. So the immediate uh, uh, danger, I think, is, is coming from the right, uh, basically from, you know, the nationalist, Trumpist right that believes that the election was stolen, uh, uh, believes in this, you know, elite conspiracy uh, against uh, the United States that are taking actual political power in state legislatures. And I agree with Bob Kagan's piece in the Post, you know, uh, right. a few weeks ago that 
we're already in the midst of a serious constitutional crisis because these Republican legislators are trying to award themselves the right to determine who uh, represents their state in a presidential election, regardless of what the actual, you know, outcome of the vote is. So that's, you know, that's a clear and present danger to the liberal constitutional order. Uh, but there is a threat on the left as well that you see very, you know, clearly in universities and in other progressive quarters where people have simply given up on liberalism and they've given up on, you know, principles like colorblindness and tolerance as fun foundational to our ability to live together in a diverse society. Uh, and for a lot of those people, you know, when you talk about diversity, it only refers to gender, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation. It doesn't actually refer to political diversity. And so there, you know, there is a, I think, a genuine intolerance uh, of, uh, you know, views that that don't match up. Uh, I, I give a long intellectual history about how we managed to get here. I do think that the intolerance in a certain sense began on the left with this whole postmodern critique. Because if you think about, you know, who would have thought to criticize modern science? Well, that's a critique that was laid by postmodernism by thinkers like Michel Foucault that said that modern dominance and power hides behind something like scientific objectivity. It pretends to be uh, neutral, but it's actually really an effort by elites to shape the way that you think and to manipulate you. Uh, and this became a very dominant theme, you know, in, in progressive circles in academia that's now spread beyond that, but it's now migrated over to the Trumpist right where you know, they picked up exactly those same things that Anthony Fauci and the NIH and all these scientists are actually not neutral public servants. They are part of a broader conspiracy that is uh, being manipulated by, you know, behind the scenes elites in order to gain political power. And so these two have kind of fed off of uh, one another. And um, it's, uh, you know, a lot of the explanation for why we are in this very illiberal phase right now, because people have not been willing to stand up and say, you know, both of these are uh, are threats to, you know, our understanding of the kind of political order that we live in. But what are the, what are, I mean, it's an impossible question to answer. And we need more sociology, I guess, on this. What are, what are the drivers of this? Radicalism, um, political violence, have been long features of this republic. Um, what what is driving the notion yeah. of, of uh, radicalizing relatively normal humans um, to adopt and embrace position? I mean, is it is it the cultural threat? Is it race? Is it economics? Is it all of the above? <laughs> You know, this is the point at which, I mean, so we've been debating this now ever since the 2016 election. And, uh, you know, my last book, Identity, was really trying to take on this question of what was driving this polarization. Was it economics, globalization, inequality, job right. loss, outsourcing, or was it cultural? Uh, and, you know, I, at that time, was arguing that the cultural factors were actually more powerful, that there's this very strong correlation, for example, between population density and how liberal you are. So if you more educated person living in a big urban agglomeration open to the global economy, you're more likely to be liberal. And if you live in a smaller town or out of the countryside, your cultural values are going to be very different. However, I would say that in the past year, that's not a sufficient framework anymore. So you take something like anti-vax, uh, you know, kind of doctrines or ideologies or, you know, conspiracy theories, which now has come to define a significant part of the Republican Party. How is that in any way related to conservative principles as we've understood them or to the sociology, you know? I mean, the sociology is even stranger because the dominant group of people that are dying from COVID these days are people that are unvaccinated. And yet, you know, that's in many cases is not sufficient to convince them that this is a kind of wrong 
uh, attitude uh, to have. And so <clears throat> I think that we've kind of left the domain of normal kind of socioeconomic theorizing about the drivers of these political trends and you're kind of forced to go to social psychology, you know, that uh, this, uh, you know, explanation that people just feel this deep, you know, satisfaction in lining up with a particular team. Uh, and it kind of doesn't matter what the team is espousing, but as long as, you know, they, they feel that that's their team, then they're going to align with it. Uh, and that just is a weird aspect of, you know, human social behavior. I mean, but it fills a need. I mean, it would seem. I mean, it's functional, isn't it? It's not some well, it's, vague philosophical thing in the ether. It works for people. It well, makes them it, feel good. I'm, I'm not sure. Well, it makes them feel or good. Not. But if, if you're dying of COVID because you've refused to get a vaccination and refused to social distance, you know, I'm not sure how good you feel about that. So it's it's so yes, there is the psychological right. So that's what I'm saying is that you have to appeal to social psychology to really understand this. At a certain point, the disjunction between this feeling of solidarity that you feel with like-minded people and your own economic self-interest or your own health self-interest, you know, in theory should become too great and, and the cognitive dissonance should make you think, ah. Maybe I've got to adjust some of my beliefs because it doesn't correspond to the reality I'm experiencing, but it hasn't happened for many people yet. But you know, Frank, if you're right, uh, it's probably the most, it's the grimmest, gloomiest projection of all, because what you're suggesting is that the remedy to the dysfunction, to the pathology may well be beyond the grasp of even effective governance and if, that, uh, you know, if that's the case then um well houston we really have a problem yeah uh that's true on the other hand i think that i mean i don't know the extent to which we want to get into kind of nitty-gritty american politics but you know there's a core of maga supporters for whom you know this thing has become like a religion and it's mm -hmm. very very difficult to figure out how you're going to push them off these sorts of beliefs. But, you know, as the most recent set of by-elections in this country indicated, there are a lot of people voting for Republicans that had voted for Biden a year ago that have somehow gotten uh, disenchanted. And, you know, I, I, I have an explanation for why, why that is, because I think Biden was, you know, fundamentally elected as a centrist, and he's been governing very much on the left. And there are just a lot of people that are very unhappy with that. Right. So you're, you're not going to convince the hardcore, you know, MAGA ethno-nationalist types of anything. But, you know, you are going to win elections by convincing, you know, this group of people that have voted, you know, for different parties in different, you know, recent elections, if you can appeal to uh, a certain set of sensible policies. And there is a certain part of the Democrats' agenda that is really unappealing to those people. And so, right. you know, I think that the way you get out of this is by the Democrats kind of waking up to this reality and adjusting, you know, their pitch uh, so that they will appeal to that kind of voter. Um, right. You remind me that we don't have to convince everybody. <clears throat> um, we're, I think, at the end of the hour, but I want to close with one quote, um, which I think you'll agree with. I, I use it every now and then to remind myself uh, that even spending an entire career in foreign policy, at, we are really at a moment of, of national inflection. Um, so let me read it to you. I, I think you'll agree. <clears throat> it's a quote from Lincoln in 1838 uh, to the Young Men's Lyceum. Here's what he says. At what point shall we expect the approach of danger? By what means shall we fortify against it? Shall we expect some transatlantic military giant to step the ocean and crush us at a blow? Never. All the armies of Europe, Asia, and Africa combined, with all the treasure of the earth, our own accepted in their military chest, with a Bonaparte for a commander, could not by force take a drink from the Ohio or make a track on the Blue Ridge in a trial of a thousand years. 
At what point then is the approach of danger to be expected? I answer, if it ever reach us, it must spring up amongst us. It cannot come from abroad. If destruction be our lot, we must ourselves be its author and finisher. Writing in the 19th century, as a nation of free men, we must live through all time or die by suicide. And with well, that. I, I agree with that. You know, there was a comic strip uh, that ran for decades and decades called Pogo. And the most memorable uh, panel from that, as I remember, was when Pogo said, I've met the enemy and he is us. <laughs> right. Frank, I want to thank you so much. Now that you're a uh, part of the Carnegie family, we'll be calling on you more and more. And I, I learned a ton. I'm sure our listeners and viewers will as well. You have a remarkable command of, uh, of the whole. And I really admire and, and respect that. So um, thanks so much again, Frank. And uh, to all listeners and viewers, to the next Carnegie Connects. Thanks okay. very much. Thank you for listening to Carnegie Connects, a production of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Views expressed are those of the host and guest panelists, and not necessarily those of the Carnegie Endowment, which takes no institutional positions on public policy issues. Subscribe to Carnegie Connects on popular platforms such as Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast platform. Like what you heard today? Learn more at carnegieendowment.org slash Carnegie Connects. Tim Martin is our audio engineer, and Catherine Buchanan and Cliff Jayapranata are our executive producers. I'm Aaron David Miller, and until next time, think positive and test negative.